Um, so what I've done is to make a PowerPoint sequence that just abstracts from the paper you've been looking at and won't go through the whole thing. There isn't really time or need, I think. Um, can I just see if you have been able to read it? Can I have a show of hands? Who's read it? Okay, so, okay. And some of this you know before. Could, could we adjust the lights, please? Is that all right? Yeah, okay. So, um, quite early in the paper then, I draw attention to the fact that... Come in, please, don't worry. Um, the fact that... Is this still too dark? Can you see this? It's all right, I think. So I suggested that when we think about social justice research, which is so prominent in educational research, I think we'll just leave it. <laughs> when we think about social justice research, there are certain traditions of research, certain practices of research that come to the fore very quickly. And I identify two. So the first one would be what is very prevalent in, in philosophical research into education, research in the tradition of John Rawls. John Rawls wrote the most famous book in English language, uh, political philosophy, in the last 50 years, the book called A Theory of Justice in 1972. And uh, this quotation I have here is actually from his later work, Justice as Fairness, but let's just have a look at it. One can try to deal with this, this question, the question of justice as fairness, by viewing political society in a certain way, namely as a fair system of cooperation over time from one generation to the next, where those engaged in cooperation are viewed as free and equal citizens and normal cooperating members of society over a complete life. We can then try to formulate principles of political justice such that if the basic structure of society, the main political and social institutions, and the way they fit together as one scheme of cooperation satisfies those principles, then we can say without pretense and fakery that citizens are indeed free and equal. And in the paper I explain a little about how he const constructs a kind of thought experiment in order to work out how we might formulate a just society if we were starting from scratch, starting with a blank slate. What would constitute a fair and just society. Is that okay then? So that's a, a key starting point for much of this tradition of political philosophy that's looked at questions of social justice in the wake of Rawls. The other tradition I was thinking of, where you hear about social justice a lot, I'm going to call very loosely critical pedagogy. Campaigns for social justice have sought both to redress inequalities and as with what, in what has become known as the politics of recognition to acknowledge the forms of human diversity. Thus, it combines elements of neo-Marxism and classic egalitarianism with a more recent sensitization to difference. Critical pedagogy can be taken as a prominent expression of such streams of thought. To get the point then, when we talk about social justice in education, most people who are doing research into it are working either in the Rawlsian tradition, talking about equal distribution of opportunities, for example, or they're working in this critical, critical pedagogy um, tradition, taking on board a kind of neo-Marxism and also the politics of recognition, the politics of difference. So, I'm struck by the rhetorical force of discursive norms, discursive forms. J.L. Austin, who was mentioned on Friday, also talked about the force of an expression, the effect the expression has, not just whether it's true or false, but what the expression is trying to do. Well, what is this rhetorical force of the discursive forms? I've identified two discursive forms. So what I'd like to emphasize is the extent to which these two principal elaborations of social justice are apt discursively to determine educational thought about these matters. In other words, the terms of the discourse dictate the way you think about it, the kinds of questions you ask, 
the kinds of moves you can make. And people become very practiced in those moves. That is, they provide the textual reference points, the vocabulary, and the rhetorical codes in which discussion takes place. There is a danger then that they become ideological in the Marxist sense to which Rawls refers. So ideological in that certain positions become hardened, are no longer challenged, are automatically articulated and become safe points for those who are writing in those traditions to revert to. It's not uncommon for an educational social science department in a university to style its work in terms of social justice. I've worked in two where the department collectively decided they were going to advertise their work as social justice research. It's so common. And in a sense, who could object? Surely we're all in favor of it. I am too. But the problem is this. They style their work in terms of social justice, whether as the name of the research focus or maybe the title of one of its courses. We have an MA course in social justice at this university. This becomes part of its narrative of itself, the way it presents itself and, of course, markets itself as well. Today, as never before, de departments are required to have a narrative to market themselves through websites and elsewhere. And the coherence, plausibility, and political marketability of this may be critical to their success, even to their survival. So that marketing of the department actually feeds into research assessment exercises. It recedes into the kinds of networks that are developed with other countries, um, in this country, to how many overseas students are recruited as well, which is a very important factor for us, as you obviously realize. Policy borrowing and the hegemony of English, what can we say about that? Well, the discourse on policy borrowing has developed uh, very rapidly. And what I mean by the discourse on policy borrowing is a meta-discourse that looks at the fact that uh, policy is borrowed by one country and adopted um, in that country, um, often with a certain sense that the first country has something superior or better. But there's a complicated political dynamics to that, and there's a meta-literature now about this, as though this also might be a form of colonization. The dominance of English is very important in this. So the coincidence of the supremacy of the British and American empires with spectacular technological, technological change has given English prominence as a language in a way that is unprecedented, that's seemingly self-reinforcing and self-perpetuating, and that, especially in the post-1989 global settlement, we've been inclined to accept as irreversible. The policy context has now been drastically altered also by changes on a global scale, with international comparisons, for example through PISA, with dependence on international organizations such as the World Bank, um, especially for poorer countries, and the World Bank will have a huge influence on what policy is allowed within a country, such that poorer countries are scarcely autonomous in this way. And thirdly, the obvious factor that there, with more, there are more general and pervasive aspects of globalization through the mass media, the internet, and travel. Now, the authority of English, well, first, English has practical authority being understood more widely than any other, in any other language in international contexts. It's just valuable to know it because it helps you to get things done. It's the language people revert to. Second, it has perceived authority because of the economic power and prestige associated with Anglophone, especially in our American culture. And remember, sorry, the, the, sheer, the sheer scale of educational research in North America, the American Educational Research, research Association, AERA, has, I think, about 15,000 members at its conference each year. 15,000. The European one would have about 1,500 by comparison. The BIRA, the British one, um, about 500, I think. Secondly, the extraordinary growth in publication in educational research 
the sheer volume of stuff that's being produced and is being published is far greater than it was 25 years ago. And of course, this is overwhelmingly in English. And then measures of research quite typically give priority to English. And that has the consequence that Anglophone, well, it is the fact that Anglophone researchers have an advantage in this, don't they? So if you're writing in Taiwan, it's probably going to give you more credit in Taiwan if you've published in an English journal. And the same is true in the Netherlands and I think every country in the world. So an example, the experience of the Taiwanese researcher when the term social justice arises, this term that we're centrally dealing with here. Well, first of all, in Anglophone contexts, say in journals and conferences in the English-speaking world, it is likely to be embedded in cultural circumstances that are only partly understood. So we've got the Taiwanese researcher who goes to an international conference and hears talk about social justice by people talking English, of course, and often with connotations of context with which she's only partly familiar. A second consequence, second factor here, is that in, in, in international contexts where there's no shared language, say, for example, where Korean and Italian people are talking together, then English is taken to be the default language, the means they use to communicate. But really, what is this English that's taken, to the, taken as the default? It's not English as a native language, it's English as a foreign language. And that is likely to stress the functional and culturally anodyne, culturally colorless, drained of culture. Do you see what I mean? It's going to be a very utilitarian kind of language. It won't be the language that I'm speaking now, which connects also with all the more intimate uses of language, which is part of my experience. For the, for the person who's speaking as a second language, it would have been learnt for the function of speaking at conferences, or booking airline tickets, or something like that. It won't be embedded in a whole way of life. And thirdly, even in circumstances that involve only native speakers of Chinese, where English is not being used, a certain kudos, that means uh, status, let's say, or prestige, may attach to the command of key terms in English. And an example here, when social justice is the topic of research in Japan, the katakana, social justice, is sometimes used instead of the authentic, more originally Japanese, shakai segi. Where social justice is translated and a corresponding expression in Chinese is used, it's likely that the respective terms will have different connotations and different chains of association. You can see, I hope, how much this connects with what I started talking about on Friday morning, those chains of connection which are inevitably there for us, unlike the situation of the lion that hears a growl. So a Chinese person's sensitivity to, sensitive to these chains of association um, will experience a difference in... Sorry, there's a, a cut in my text here. The point is that if the Chinese person is confronted by both the Chinese term and the English term, they will experience a difference between semantic fields. For the native speaker of English, encountering only the English term, this will not be so. In both cases, the presence and power of English will have its effects, totally and directly in the case of the English speaker, partially and indirectly in that of the Chinese. So the Chinese in this context is in the better position because they experience that difference. The monolingual person, I'm using that in the everyday sense, the monolingual person who speaks only English doesn't experience that difference. So it's a familiar point that languages divide up the world in different ways. But it is convenient, especially for English speakers, to play down its importance. Yes, we know Spanish speakers have different words from blue, but it doesn't really matter because we can all point to the chair and say it's blue. So the English person plays down the difference. And it's convenient to do that. And this leads to the complacent assumption that this is just a matter of translation. That translation is primarily a technical matter, 
and that differences between languages are just things we need to overcome, technical problems we need to overcome. And I'm sure you know that uh, in the 19th century especially, there were fantasies of creating a world language or a book called Esperanto, which would overcome all these problems we have with translation. And some very intelligent people into the 20th century, probably now too, still think that would be a, an advance. If only we could get everyone to speak English, then all this complication will be done away with. I hope you can see from what I'm saying that um, uh, I think, and the people I'm referring to, um, in the, the, the philosophers I'm quoting also think this is an extremely dangerous prospect. So think of this um, idea that translation is just a technical problem. Think of it as a suppression of thought. And it's a suppression of thought of which the monolingual person may be unaware, the person who's speaking English all the time. Any questions so far? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, what I want to head towards then is changing the subject. And much of what follows in this section is uh, related to the work of Naoki Sakai. Uh, Naoki Sakai is uh, probably late 60s now, and he works at the University of America where he's been for a long time and where he did his PhD. Um, but he comes from Tokyo, and he had a career in business before he went into the academic world. He's written a lot about translation in the way that we've been considering it. So, one starting point for what he says is that uh, is uh, the work of Tetsuro Suzuki. Now, Suzuki was writing in the first half of the 19th century, before Japan's op opening, during its period of closure. And Suzuki was looking at foreign language learning. He was looking at how that was going on in Japan. And he understood such learning in terms of the acquisition of an ancient language of China or Japan. But the crucial thing for present purposes is that this process of learning a foreign language was understood in a quite different way from what we think of it of today normally. So today, you might learn a foreign language because you want to get a taste of its literature, or more likely, because you want to go abroad or uh, study in that language, or something like that. But under the circumstances that Suzuki was looking at it, those who undertook this process were motivated uh, by and engaged in a practice that was very much different. So it was a matter of absorbing the textures of a social and political reality different from one's own. And it was in addition, through this, Sakai claims, that there would be a co-figuring of both languages. So neither, you start to learn another language, and it, in a sense, in your participation, is changed in some sense, because you coming from outside cannot understand it or live it in exactly the same way as the person who's there already. You've got the point of comparison with your own language. But conversely, your own ways of thinking, your own sense of who you are, your own practices will change through the process. Right. Oh, that's wrong, isn't it? Sorry. So whereas the contemporary study of literature might be conceived in terms of, say, a literary critical approach, and a language might be studied for instrumental reasons. In Suzuki's account, learning is closer to the experience of the novice monk, where one, one becomes absorbed in the content and textual practices of the language in question, including its characteristic discipline, disciplining of the body. And one commits oneself or submits oneself to its ethos. Now, if I want to learn holiday Spanish, I might buy a Berlitz uh, introductory textbook, um, and I might be reading it in bed, or while I'm sitting on the bus, or lying in the bath, who knows? I might do it in all sorts of different circumstances. Well, the TV's on, maybe. But what I understand from this is that the whole practice of reading would involve sitting down in a particular way, attending to the book in a particular way, a certain context of silence and appropriate attention. That's why the, the connection with the novice, novice monk is suggested. So Sakai takes this to be an ecstatic project, 
a project of moving away from and getting out of the self-same that the figure of a foreign language solicits me to venture into. It's a project of transforming me into that which is not familiar, rather than a project of returning to the authentic self. So when I learn a bit of Spanish, because of going on holiday or because I want to buy a house in Spain or something, then that's very utilitarian, very functional. I might like the flavor of the language, but it's really an addition to myself. It's an increment. What's said here is quite different. So he's got this Heideggerian word, ecstatic. Heidegger will say that our being, as human mm. beings, is ecstatic because we are not just self-contained, we're partly outside ourselves. So it's nothing to do with being wildly happy or with drugs of this name. It's to do with the very nature of human experience, of human ontology. So the lion lying there in the sun is fully present in the moment, simply absorbed in where she is, let's say. But the human being is always, in this moment, it's always created by something you were doing earlier, or what you studied last week, or by some anticipation of the future. Moreover, we're not self-contained in that we're always related somehow or other to other people. Even the fact that we're using language means that we start from that circulation of signs that's already out there. So in a very real sense, I'm not static in myself. I'm ecstatic, ex, outside myself. So there's that gesture at the beginning of that quotation. And it's a project of moving away. Project, that's actually a Sartrean word, isn't it? A project of throwing forward. I, my being is not just self-contained like the lions, because I'm anticipating something that's coming next. There's always some future that I'm oriented towards. And Heidegger will say the future is prior to the present. Do you see that? Because how I think of the present is partly governed by this vision of the future that's already there, feeding back into the present. Project literally means thrown forward. <coughs> Sorry about the coughing. And so I'm moving out of the self-same, and you asked me yesterday what ipse meant. Um, self-same is very close to that idea. Out of the self-same which the figure of language, the foreign language, is soliciting me into, it's drawing me into, it's calling me forth. And it's a project of transforming me into what's not familiar, again, it's ecstatic, not a project of returning to the same. The project of returning to the same really characterizes so much developmental psychology, because although there's a change, though there's a change, it's understood very often as a kind of incremental change, building up from some starting point, in the way that we understand biological change. Clearly there are, there's an element of truth to that, but there is so much more going on in the human being. Hence the encounter with the foreign language realizes a possibility of subjectivity on both fronts, the home language and the foreign language, and this is transformative in kind. So the language I'm learning itself is partly developed by the fact that I, coming from outside, am learning it. Just as English is developed by the fact that so many of you who didn't have it as a native language now contribute to it. So English isn't just one thing. English develops into multiple forms. So translating the subject. And I'm happy if there's a little bit of ambiguity around the word subject, because the subject could be the human subject, subjectivity and so on, but also an academic subject. So Sakai explains this in terms of divergent conceptions of subjectivity, realized in two possible translations of the word subject, a term notoriously problematic for Japanese and Chinese translators. I'm sure for many other translators as well. But probably there's a greater, there's a fair continuity in words that connect to subject in European languages. So thus there is the epistemological subject as shukan and the subject of practice as shutai. And the second Chinese character um, for Shutai um, expresses something about the body, the sense of the body, the subject of praxis, 
Marx's subject, not the subject that's Descartes' subject, looking at the outside world and reflecting on it, but the engaged subject, the subject who is doing something. <coughs> yes, I should probably start by repeating what I just said, which is that if you think of Descartes, then Descartes prompts the thought that there's a mind in here and all sorts of stuff out there. And how does the mind relate to the world? Well, I, I send a message, I pick up the bottle, and so on. So there's a detachment of mind and body. Now, of course, that lays the way for much thinking um, in Western thought in the next 400 years. That way of thinking is also reinforced by the advance of science and technology, um, because science, to a large extent, encourages us to think of the world as behind a screen, a microscope or a telescope, and so on. So there's the separation. And many thinkers, but Karl Marx is a key one, he will come and consider this way philosophy operates this hardening of the closed epistemological subject contemplating the world. And he says, well, wait a minute. It's not really as simple as that. If we look at human beings' experience, then a lot of what they do, including their most rich and most um, uh, intelligent activity, involves doing something and he adopts the Greek word praxis, engagement in practice. Right. So, I was thinking about the Husserlian perspective, and this may create me a little bit, I didn't understand very well this distinction, because in some sense they are very near. Yes. Um, I don't know if uh, I explain what I was saying in this sense. Because epistemological subject, for me, means the way how we know and the way how we know it is, is connected with practice, because I'm doing with my body, to my body, what I want to know. Okay, okay. I mean, Husserl's very complicated, because yeah. of course he's not Cartesian, he's trying to do okay. something different through a sort of phenomenology, yeah. and considering the nature of experience. Um, I, I don't want to say too much about that right now, because it may take up too much time. Okay. But um, the implications of this epistemological subject are more to do with the reasoning, the, the mind as a reasoning um, uh, thing, yeah. rather than a doing thing. Okay. Abstract rationality yeah, comes yeah. in this tradition. Yes, more. abstract yeah. rationality, engaged uh, thought. Thank you. The, the crucial thing to understand, though, is that the translator is in a, is in a, 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 a fix. What is she going to do? Because she's got this word subject coming up again and again in Western philosophy. She's trying to translate these texts into Japanese or into Chinese, and she has to go one way or another in terms of which of these she chooses. It's not quite the same in Chinese but I, as it is in Japanese, as far as I understand, but there are some similarities and certainly similar problems. Right. Well, we need to contextualize this a little bit more. Why is all this translation going on? The reason is that um, philosophy, in the sense we think of it normally, the academic tradition that's come through the centuries, didn't exist in Japan until the late 19th century. Now, of course, through the ages, people have asked questions like, what's the meaning of life, and even what is, what is it to know something? But they hadn't developed a tradition of uh, thinking about these things in academic circumstances like universities at that stage. After 1868, with the opening of Japan to the outside world and the deliberate project of going out into the world to find out what was happening and bringing back some of that literature, some of those ideas, one of the things that came back was indeed philosophy. And Amane Nishi, in the late 19th century, created a name for it, Tetsugaku, and he, he gave Shukan more positive connotations by preserving it he gave Shukan priority by choosing it um, to represent subject. Okay, so his choice of subject there excluded possible connotations in the European words that embraced both the epistemological subject and the subject of practice and put the emphasis on epistemological subject. Does that make sense? So the, the, the translation has been crucial in shaping certain assumptions about what philosophy is. You can tell, I'm not just making this up, of course, because I'm following Naoki Sakai. Uh, 
and I've spoken about this in Japan and elsewhere. Sakai formulates a distinction then between what he calls the shukanteki technology, shukan-like technology, and the shutai technology, shutateki, the shutai-like technology. And by technology, he's not just thinking of computers and stuff like that. He's thinking of, about technology much more broadly in the Foucauldian terms of technologies of the self. In other words, the, the ways of speaking, the forms of discourse, and the structures of practice we have, which shape our idea of what the self is, or what subjectivity is. So the former expression, the epistemological one, the former expression connotes a more conventional conception of technology wherein the subject manipulates and transforms the, the object for a predetermined objective, while the latter conception, the praxis type one, suggests an understanding of technology as involving also the subject's manufacturing and production of itself. So if it's purely Shukanteki, then it's like I'm an inventor and I think let's produce this, let's produce that. These new gadgets will help us to change the world in some way. But if there's a Shutai technology, techie, technology, conception of technology, then I will realize that in these different transformations I'm producing, like for example producing um, uh, Facebook, it's not just a convenient way of transferring information, Facebook's also something that changes the subject. It changes who we are, how we think of ourselves. It's a new possibility, a new structure of thought. So the technology is actually productive of the self. It's not something that the self merely uses. I realize this is quite difficult, uh, but he, Sakai makes connections with writing much earlier on, this is uh, Kitaro Nishida, the most prominent philosopher of the so-called Kyoto School of Philosophy, the most distinctive contribution of Japan to Western philosophy, which flourished in the first half of the 20th century. And Kitaro Nishida says something that's really remarkably simple, similar. One may automatically assume that proiesis or technology, that is the production of things, is immediately Shukanteki. So we've got the inventor deciding on a machine or some other form of production, producing it, and it's all kind of rationally controlled. But what may appear simply technological, such as the building of a house, is perhaps only upon the relevant historical, is possible only upon the relevant historical substrata. Whereas what may appear unrelated to technology, such as language, must, in fact, be technologically constituted. It goes without saying that society cannot exist without language. Hence, our dialogue here and now is already a historical manufacturing act. Let me pause, because I said to you, didn't I, that the words I'm saying now, the ones I said on Friday, and the ones you said, were new productions in the world. However, minimally, the world was changed by that. You know, two days ago, those things hadn't been said. So that our words are part of what produces the world. And is therefore a matter of technology. Technology requires dexterity. You know what dexterity means. It's uh, ability to, to manipulate and use things skillfully. So technology requires dexterity, but dexterity means the historical formation of the individual's habits. So on my analogy then, Facebook, the technology of Facebook, actually shapes our habits, it's part of our habit formation. And that's a historical uh, thing of importance. However, the habits are not formed by the individual's subjective act in a kind of calculated way, like the epistemological subject is dominant. They are formed as historical manufacturing acts. Otherwise, we would never be able to manufacture anything by those habits. Our habits, therefore, are the habits of the historical world. Now, I know it's, it's very dense, but the point is that these things we produce are events, new things in history, and they change the way the subject is. They change the way you and I are. They change possibilities for ourselves. And I think we, 
have some sense of that, surely, don't we? Because the fact that you spend so long on Facebook now, or whatever it is, of frantic emailing all day, that gives you a different kind of life from the one you would have had 20 years ago. Right, let's move on then and take it to a slightly broader level. The grafting of an image. Grafting is what happens when you've got an apple tree and you take a branch from a pear tree, you tie it together and the pear grows from the apple. We also get skin grafts if we've had a car accident, for example, and been badly burned. While it may seem that shukan, the epistemological subject, is the mode of subjectivity of the West, and shutai, that sort of engagement in practice, Buddhist uh, activities, care over gesture, manners, and so on. Sakai is eager to show that the Japanese are also shukanteki in their construction of the West. Thus, the interiority called Japan in Tetsuro Watsuji's anthropology from the 1930s and 1940s ends up being thoroughly Western. There's an irony to this. The grafting of an image of Japan on Japan determined by Western notions of identity. So the driving thing there is the notion of identity. And the notion of identity is not, a, is not something that's there naturally for everybody. It's something that's constructed by the West. In the same way, subjects are apt to become shukan, epistemologically uh, oriented, in confronting cultural difference, insofar as in this process, the other is objectified. So the West objectifies the East in Orientalism, and then in the reverse process, the same thing happens. The West is objectified in a kind of Occidentalism. But the process of objectification in that way, of laying an identity on this other group, is itself a Western process, a Western notion of identity. To identify Shutai as the defining characteristic of subjectivity in the East, is ironically self-defeating, because you've turned this thing that's not a thing into a thing. So these are questions about what can be understood by identity itself. By should I, therefore, Sakai continues, I like to suggest the, the impossibility of full saturation of any identity. Of course, I talked about the sign as unsaturated, he clearly is alluding to that idea. The impossibility of full saturation of any identity, and particularly of the agent of action, as well as an undecidability that underwrites the possibility of social and ethical action. The undecidability is that you can never know that what you're doing is, is right. You, know, you never know what these consequences will be, how something will be interpreted. There's always that uh, risk, if you like, in action. It's never like a machine. Yet the shutai, the, the practically engaged subject, is not the agent of action possessing free choice, as it's understood in liberal humanism, because freedom is neither owned by it nor in it. So, so much Western thought, um, especially in the tradition of liberal humanism, has aimed at rational autonomy thinking that as long as I can get the reasoning right, and assuming I've got some strength of will, then I can rationally work out what to do with my life, and then I will be free, as long as there aren't external constraints. But if what we were saying about language is right on Friday, my thinking is never so totally in my control as that would imply. My language is not merely an instrument at my disposal, but it's partly something that shapes me, as is Facebook, or all those other things I might use. So that Facebook, that the conditions of freedom are always something beyond my control. Um, they're never something I could master or get an overview of fully. <coughs> Sakai's resistance here, I think, is against the idea of freedom as either the possession of a subject or as internal to a self, to an ego. And the reason for this is that freedom is out there in the engagement of ethical action and with the absence of any final settlement. Plainly, the metaphysics implied by his remarks here is at odds with the assumption that pervade the Rawlsian discourse of rational choosers. And plainly then, this must have its bearings on, way, bearings 
on ways in which social justice is conceived and realized. So we've seen that the problems faced by the translator in the face of the word subject, we, we've seen that, and inevitably in philosophy and social science, not to mention practical politics, this is a peculiar, pivotal term. So the cross-cultural consequences of this translational problem should be plain enough. But in fact, this exemplifies a more general difficulty. The translator normally confronts a gap between meanings for which there is no ultimately satisfactory resolution. As a result, the translator experiences the space for judgment, precisely that space where there is no rule to resolve the difficulty she faces. There is then an inherent openness and absolution, lacking of solution, non-solution, in what she does. Thus, translation, as Saikai claims, is a shutai teki technology par excellence. It involves the engaged practice, the subject in engaged practice, in a supreme way, par excellence. In this respect, uh, this is something to which the morally, the, sorry, the monolingual person may be morally blind. It's easy for the monolingual person to think that there is an ultimate order, there is a set of rules, and we can plan it out according to that set of rules. So Sakai's term here has multiple senses, but at the same time, it should indicate that the task she faces, the translator faces, cannot be understood in any simple logic of problem solving. And I choose problem solving there because that again is the way that uh, so much of the discourse about critical thinking has developed. Critical thinking is about problem solving. If it's problem solving, you've got a very clear cut problem and you need to take steps to its resolution. But the kind of thing the translator faces is far more open than that. It's breaking open to something further at every moment. And there won't be a solution as such. So the difficulty she faces is irreducible, although she must still exercise judgment and act. The fact that subjects become shukanteki in the objectification of the other, and that this can happen at an intercultural level, is amply evident in the familiar forms of Orientalism. The West makes the East into the exotic, the fascinating, the very beautiful sometimes, but it, it sort of fixes it like that. But, and this can happen at an intercultural level, and this is amply evident in the familiar forms of Orientalism. Sorry. So Sakai exposes, in his account of Japan's response to the West, what might be called a corresponding or Occidentalism, and it would seem that this reciprocates with the West in the process of co-figuring that Sakai describes. So there, the, the West makes itself more secure in its identity by constructing this caricature of the East, this simplified version of the East. In a sense, the East is doing the same on this logic by constructing a version of the West. But, in my view, there remains a difference. The West's Orientalism is born out of a sense of superiority coupled to an ethnocentric universalist metaphysics. The European thought has assumed that it can speak for humanity as a whole. When Kant's writing, he thinks he's describing human being, human being in its universal sense, and he's insensitive to difference in some ways. So while Japan has its own sense of superiority, even if this falters at times, there is a crucial difference in that its Occidentalism, its construction of the West, is not derived from an indigenous universalist metaphysics. Okay, so there is no, nothing indigenous to Japanese thought that has that universalist retention that's found in the West. Now, of course, Occidentalism is not confined to Japan, and this latter point, I believe, applies to the manifestations of Occidentalism in other countries, other non-Western countries. Right, final point then, a graft upon a graft, 
So you know what a graft is. Imagine you've got the apple tree and a pear growing off it, then a banana, how implausible, growing off that. A graft upon a graft. I confess that I do not know quite what to make of all this, if it's true, but it does strike me that whereas Orientalism may be a natural, though objectionable, outgrowth of Western ways of thinking, Occidentalism has the character of a double grafting. It's grafted on a borrowed notion, borrowed notion of subjectivity and of the very idea of identity. <coughs> the East construction of the West is grafted on a Western construction of the East, but the origin of such identity construction is in Western thoughts of representation and objectification. Western notions of identity, Western practices, practices of thinking. That's it. So I hope that you know, deals with some of those difficult sections from the paper. What I go on to do is to come back to John Rawls and then contrast Rawls's emphasis on cooperation with Stanley Cavell's preoccupation with conversation, where the second syllable of conversation, VRS, from vertira in Latin meaning turn, suggests not um, suggests the something of the dynamics of talking to one another, where thoughts go off at tangents and something is bounced back in a surprising direction. And that idea of turning also has an echo of Plato's cave. You know Plato's cave in the myth? Mm -hmm. Prisoners are looking at the cave, and for the educated, they have to turn towards the light. So the idea of turning is there slightly. I'll explain that later. I think most people are familiar, but perhaps one or two are not. Tell me if you don't know about that later. <coughs> so, Cavell thinks um, Rawls's politics is insufficient in this respect. Do, do you want to just share some thoughts about this now, just uh, together? Just uh, tell me what you, how you've responded to this, and whether how it connects with what else you've been doing, maybe related to the films if you want to as well. <coughs> The relationship between uh, Occidentalism and Orientalism, which you just explained. Yes. Are, are you saying that this idea of Occidentalism and um, Orientalism sort of complement each other mm -hmm. in such a way that the, uh, the construction of image, um, construction of mutual construction of image, is from the beginning based upon Western construction of identity? Um, I don't know if I'm saying exactly that. I mean, certainly I think one way to look at this is that the West constructs a false image of the East, which is convenient for the West, and makes the West feel better about itself. That's roughly what Evan Said says when he writes about Orientalism. And then you can look at the way that the uh, East constructs an image of the West, and we can call that Occidentalism. So it looks as though they're doing the same thing, um, so you get some sense of a balancing between the two. What I want to say is actually there's more of an asymmetry than that suggests. Because the whole practice of identifying in this way, I think, belongs, belongs to Western thought. Yes. Of course, I don't mean something as absurd as to suggest that um, Eastern peoples never notice difference between things. Of course, I don't mean anything remotely like that. But the construction of identity that goes on in, in Orientalism is much more pernicious, much more harmful because it fixes something and it also positions itself in a certain way in relation to it. It shores itself up, it strengthens its position in relation to that thing. And the construction of that identity of Orientalism is based upon a kind of naturalness of the European as well. You know, that the European as the universal type. Do you see that? So, so the, the universalist metaphysics that I referred to before, I think is not part of, East, part of Eastern thought. So in, in a way, in that sense, uh, Occidentalism and Orientalism are not on the same ground. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. So since you say ground, I mean the, the Western idea is very grounded because the West is obsessed with ground and foundations and so on. And so you can think in terms of a big tree, the branches going off it. Eastern thought tends not to rely on that kind of um, imagery to the same extent. Very nice. <coughs> this relationship would be different if instead of having this uh, metaphysics um, 
um, inclusion of the philosophy not in, in East, West into East, if it was uh, the continental philosophy instead? Does well, it would make a difference in terms of how they would relate to, to West? Yes, so partly what I'm talking about uh, uh, derives from some aspects of continental philosophy which have broken away from this hardened notion of the European uh, epistemological subject, the European subject of thought. Okay, so it's, I mean, if you look, look at the post-structuralist writers, or go back a bit further, the phenomenologists and Heidegger and so on, then they're already at odds with Western thought. They're, they're providing part of the challenge that I think we need. Uh, and they're suspicious of the idea of the, the universal subject. Is that right? Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. But I think when you go deeper into the tradition, and certainly Kant is a, a problem in this tradition, I think, um, Kant, Descartes, and so on, then you're not just talking about Anglophone uh, philosophy. It's, it's much more inherent in Europe. And it goes with Europe's um, uh, empires, doesn't it? You know, that, that confidence in, in European thought is partly related to uh, it, the power over the last thousand years that European, or more than that, that European countries have had, and how far they felt they could assert themselves in other parts of the world. Do you agree with that or not? You know, yeah, yeah. There was a kind of uh, interesting thing if they took this tradition from West, if they find found their identity, where you can call that something that was already identical to signal in order to choose this to take a one instead of choosing something else within a traditional philosophy from Yes, um, I, I, I mean, if you're talking about the choice of the word Shukai uh, Shukan, then of course I don't know exactly what um, Nishi was thinking when he, he did that. Uh, I, other people here would know far better than I do, of course, exactly what the tensions are there between those terms. But I, I don't suppose he would have thought things through at the level we're talking about here, because some of the things we're thinking just wouldn't have been available to thinkers in the 19th century. So what I'm trying to do a little bit is the kind of thing that Fanel does when he talks about the way that uh, in post-colonial societies, the practices of the empire are repeated once the country gets independence. You know, the, the new um, people who come to the top behave like the British or the French had done before. So, so there are forms of uh, imposition on those cultures which are much more surreptitious and difficult to, to discover than, than is apparent at first sight. Now, when independence comes, it's not simply independence. It's always more complicated, as you know better than I do. Um, and in the case of Japan, the relationship's quite different, of course. It's not a simple colonization or anything like that. But nevertheless, there are other ways in which Western thought encroaches on, and I would say partly distorts or suppresses um, elements in the other culture. To the, to, the, to the loss, not just of, the, uh, of Japan, but of the West. Because clearly, I, from what I'm saying, I, I'd much rather that some of those elements of Japanese thought, those non-universalist elements of Japanese thought, such as I imagine them, were realized in the West in, in place of uh, the West's confidence in this Yes? Um, I think what, what you're talking about, um, a lot of what you're talking about is related to what we've been discussing in this good, good. last few days, but you also brought in, uh, in this paper particularly the, the issue of social justice. Yes. And, and um, in the last bit, uh, um, particularly, uh, um, in a, in a passage, uh, one of the passage, yes. I feel, and I, I believe you share with this as well, um, so it says the issue is not whether there is a choice between the virtue of cooperation and of conversation. Um, the issue is what their relation is, whether one of them discourages the other. Yes. And I think, um, as, you, uh, as you said in your first section, um, Rose, uh, the concept uh, of social justice in roles um, is more uh, emphasis more on um, cooperation mm -hmm. 
and you kind of try to, through this discussion, you try to bring the idea of conversation. And, but if it's true, um, to some extent, one of them is going to, dis well, probably, is going to discourage the other to some extent. I wonder how much you want to um, say um, conversation, the, the concept of conversation can replace or uh, well, cooperation yes, um, I, if we talk about social justice. Yes. I think partly what you're saying is that cooperation colonizes conversation. So we start to think of all our actions in terms of the logic of cooperation as a rational means to sort through what we're doing so that we produce certain agreed outcomes. Um, and I do indeed think that's the case. I think that conversation is under threat from this instrumental conception of what it is to talk and communicate with one another. Again, it goes back to the starting point of this, these three days, because I started off with that bad idea of what language was. There's person A and person B. She has an idea. She wants to convey it to this one. It's all understood very, very instrumentally and, and technically. And it loses sight of the vitality of conversation where the words are out there and we don't quite know where they're going to go because they do have all sorts of associations we aren't anticipating. When you have a talk with somebody over a cup of coffee, if it's a good talk, you don't know what it's going to be about. It's not like trying to sell somebody something or to do a deal, is it? Now just translate that into the classroom for a moment. And the well-made class, you know, the one that the inspectors or policy makers would like us to have, in schools in this country begins by three objectives being set on the whiteboard. And then the good teacher, good teacher, will efficiently lead the students to the realization of those objectives. Now I'm not against having objectives. I'm in favor of some sort of planning about what you're going to do and being clear about the subject matter. But it's a really sad thing if that's all the class is doing. Because some of the best teaching and learning happens when people become absorbed in what's going on and they get lost in what they're doing, lost in a good sense. A lost can mean being absorbed. They get lost in translation actually, they get lost in this process of ideas moving from this to that to something else. So in educational policy and practice and theorizations about teaching and learning, there is a colonization by notions of instrumental, instrumental communication upon notions of conversation, conversations being pushed to the side. Not just in classrooms and schools, in classrooms and universities, that's happening as well. So you know, some students will come to an undergraduate course and they're listening out for what are the key points that they must repeat in the exam. So they don't pay too much attention to the others. As long as they can pick out those points, then they'll be sure to put them in their answers in the exam. And the marker has also been trained to follow the checklist of criteria and to tick the points as they come through. In this place, it's, it, this happens in a much more um, gentle, in a gentle way. But there are universities that do operate like that, where they think that objectivity is achieved by having a long list of criteria, and then you literally mark like this. Um, I, I used to teach in Scotland at one time, as you, most of you know, and um, I was just a little bit involved with a, a Bachelor of Education course there. Um, the students, when they did their written work, their essays, <coughs> would only get either a pass or a fail. There were no grades. And it was made very clear to them that they must get these points, otherwise their markers, however impressed they were, couldn't give them the pass. But what was also implied was that there was absolutely no point in doing anything more. If they had other ideas, no point in putting them down. The only thing that mattered were those seven points or whatever it was. So that's a disaster, I think. Um, you know, it's a disaster for education, and it's a very sad state if our lives get reduced to that, because we are talking people, talking, writing, you know, conversing people. Conversations are the essence of being a human being. Yes. Um, it's only the yes. Movie, and uh, tell me about short break, and then we'll go to the yes, okay. and yeah. then continue this conversation. Well, we'll, 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 we'll see how much people want to do that, but that's that's fine. Okay. So a little break anyway. That's good. So shall we have a 10 minutes break and then uh, the initial discussion?